one thing that I've always learned is that you don't give up. And, you know, if you give up in a fight, then you're done. And this is no different. What's happening, everybody? It's episode 60 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, the only place to hear the best stories from the best martial artists, like today's guest, so could I, David Nemiroff. I'm the founder here at Whistlekick, but most listeners know me best as the host. My name is Jeremy Lesniak. Whistlekick, if you don't know, makes the world's best sparring gear as well as great apparel and accessories, all for practitioners of traditional martial arts. I'd like to welcome the new listeners and thank all of our returning fans. If you're not familiar with our products, you should check out everything we make, like our killer boots. If you're tired of slipping on the floor with your boots, or you just want the most durable and breathable sparring boot you can get, we've got you covered. You can check out our boots and the rest of what we offer at whistlekick.com. If you want to listen to other podcast episodes or see the show notes, those are at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. And while you're over there, go ahead and sign up for our newsletter. We offer exclusive content to subscribers, and it's the only place to find out about upcoming guests for the show. Now, let's move on to the episode. It's episode 60, and I'm talking to Sokodai David Nemiroff, an Aikido practitioner who is also a school owner, author, instructor, and much more. Sokodai Nemiroff does as most of our guests do and really opens up. I came away from this episode feeling truly inspired about my martial arts training, and I hope you do too. So, here we go. Sokodai Nemiroff, welcome to Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have you here, and I'm looking forward to learning more about you, and I'm sure the listeners are also looking forward. I think you're our first practitioner of Aikido that we've had on the show. I'm doing a mental check, so that's cool. Not that we we get real big on dividing people up by style or anything, but we try to round it out, so it's great to have you on the show. And it's an honor to be here. Your, well, good. Awesome. So... Let's go back. Let's get started the way we get started with all of our guests. How did you get started in the martial arts? Well, um, I kind of had two, uh, you know, main factors that got me started in the martial arts. Um, one was uh, my uh, my cousin who uh, was into martial arts and still in, in martial arts and, uh, you know, eventually became one of my teachers. Um he used to take me uh, into his basement, you know, and we're, you know, this is when we were very, very young and he would try and uh, he'd basically use me as a throwing dummy and, uh, you know, test out his moves on me, you know, who I had no experience. And so he would, you know, he would uh, ask me to attack him and then, uh, and then, you know, he would test things out, uh, you know, as, as, uh, as part of his training. Um, and, um, that and then he, you know, he started to, you know, say, why don't you, uh, you know, why don't you try some things and why don't you, you know, pursue some martial arts where 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 I was located at the time. Uh, so that was one impetus. And then the other one was um, I had a friend who, uh, after a religion class, we would he would go to the Aikido dojo, uh, and uh, he kept saying for you know for a long time, why don't you come in and, and try class and. Uh, eventually one day I did and, and, uh, I've been going ever since. So what was it in those early days that appealed to you? Well, um, I'll tell you, you know, when I was growing up, I, you know, I was a very shy, introverted child, uh, very, you know, I didn't have a lot of uh, self-esteem and, um, and when I saw what, you know, these people were doing, it, it was so impressive that uh, I said, you know, I, I want to learn how to do this. Um, and and so that really was uh, a motivator for me. Awesome. So let's move forward a little bit. Okay. You've been training for quite a few years, and I'm sure you've got stories. Everybody that's been training, it seems, even a few years, has some pretty incredible stories. As martial artists, stories are just something that it seemed to happen. We do some crazy stuff. Mm-hmm. So why don't you tell us your best martial arts story? Uh, I mean, there are so many. I, I could fill up uh, the show just with different stories that I've had over the years. Um, but I would say one story that that uh, kind of is important to me is uh, when I went to Japan. Uh, we, you know, we did a little bit of sightseeing along with our training, and um, 
we went up to the samurai uh, village up in the mountains. Um, and I, I want to say off the top of my head, the village was called Nico, but you know, don't quote me on that. But um, um, it was absolutely uh, beautiful and inspiring to be up where, you know, these, you know, ancient samurai once trained and, uh, you know, it just kind of, uh, made a connection for me, uh, you know, with, with the martial arts and the Japan, uh, that, that I hadn't had before. And, and, and don't get me wrong, I, I always connected with the martial arts. Um, it's always been a passion of mine since, you know, since a young child, but, but, uh, going there for me was, it was just amazing. And, and that was kind of, an inspiration for me to, to do my, uh, weekend warrior camp, which what we do is we go up to the, uh, Catskill mountains and there's this beautiful, like three tier waterfall. And, uh, we do training, you know, and I try like, I try and, uh, emulate what the samurai must have done. And we do, you know, we do training outside and, and, you know, with different weapons and we do uh meditation in the water. And, you know, I try and, uh, recreate the experience as best as I can for uh participants of the event but uh but yeah being up at, at that uh, village was just uh it was just amazing for me well that sounds pretty powerful to actually be in a space where samurai did, did you say live and trained or just trained or well I, they must have they must have lived up there also um i mean it, it was pretty high up in the mountains there uh you know it was just beautiful i mean just the architecture and uh, just the energy that was there. It was just phenomenal. Sounds like kind of that stereotypical scene when we think of medieval or, or ancient Japan and the people living in the mountains and training. You know, I, I can imagine if it's in the mountains, there's probably some amazing view. Oh, it was gorgeous. It was absolutely plenty of beautiful. Op- plenty of opportunities to take that um, that almost cliche but still incredible image of someone practicing on a, a post or a rock with the setting sun behind them or the, the rising sun behind them. That's, that's what I'm picturing as you're telling that. that yeah. That, pretty... that's, that was, that was a lot like what it was, you know? And uh, so, yeah, it was just incredible. So yeah. tell us a little bit about this, this weekend warrior camp that you do that, that you're reenacting or, or kind of simulating some of the, that training. Sure. So, um, I try and, uh, you know, immerse, uh, all the participants in, in the experience. And, you know, we start off, um, in the morning after breakfast, you know, uh, we, we start off with meditation and what we'll do is we'll, we'll go, uh, we'll go to this waterfall and, um, and you can actually see on, on the, uh, website, you can see video of this waterfall. It's beautiful. And so what we do is we hike up, it's about a half mile hike and, uh, uh, up this mountain. And then, then we get to this waterfall. And so we do meditation. We do Qigong or Muxo up in the, in the waterfall. And, um, the energy there is just phenomenal. Um, and you know, with the, being immersed in nature, it's it just, it's just, it's just a really great experience. So we'll do that. Um, <clears throat> we'll do meditation up there. Then what we'll do is, uh, We'll do some sort of weapons training. Uh, this year coming up, we're going to be doing, um, the, we're going to be doing the sword and we're also going to be doing, uh, some stick fighting. Uh, and so, uh, we'll be doing that up on the, on the cliffs of, of this waterfall. And then what we do is we, we break, we have a, a lunch and, um, and then what we do is we, we go back and, uh, there's a, a campground. They give us this, uh, really cool area, secluded. And it's wrapped around by like a, like trees. So you're like, you're like in, in, encompassed with the nature all around you. And, um, and then we'll do, we'll do throwing techniques. We'll do ground grappling techniques and we'll do that for a couple hours. Um, and so it's, it's pretty rigorous and the guys uh, and, and uh, ladies are, are fairly tired. Um, and then we'll go swimming. Uh, and then we'll have a dinner. And then after dinner, we do some more training. And, uh, and then we'll do some nighttime meditation to close out the day. So we, we do several hours of training throughout the day. It's not just like, you know, one and one hour and done. Um, you know, you get a rigorous, uh, workout and, uh, you know, there's a lot of information that I share, uh, in, in many different styles so that, you know, people can experience, you know, the many different arts of Japan and Okinawa. Sounds great. I mean, not just the setting, but 
you know, just that kind of vibe of being around people, training all day and multiple disciplines. Sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah, and what's nice also is a lot of the people that go develop a friendship and a camaraderie that um, they don't have uh, with, you know, with others, you know, that that don't go to this event. Um, I I find that there's... Uh, a, a real, a real brotherhood that that develops with the people that go to this event, and and they reminisce about stories of things that happen at the event, and um, we actually have like a we do like a photo album for people that go to the event. You know, they can buy a photo album of of different uh, you know training uh, uh, sessions that we do, and so you know people really seem to uh, like it a lot. Yeah, I've I've been part of a number of experiences like what you're describing over the years and there's definitely something to be said for taking yourself out of your typical training space those four walls that you're used to and whether it's people you train with all the time or people that you're complete strangers with there are a lot of bonds and a lot of there's a lot of different perspective that comes from training in a different space so i'd like to encourage anyone that's listening you know if you have that opportunity to get out to a weekend seminar or or even you know if you're an instructor just If it's warm out, take your students down to the park, down to the beach, something like that, because there's a lot that comes out of that different environment. Would you agree? Oh, definitely. I think, you know, um, always being in the same environment can be limiting because and and especially because when we're attacked uh, in reality, we're we're not in the dojo. We're outside, you know, we're we're walking the streets or, you know, we're out, you know, out in nature. Uh, So. It, it, it kind of is, is closer to reality, I think. Um, plus, the, just the fresh air and, and the energy of, of the environment can play a role in your training. So I think, uh, I think it, it's really important to, to explore outside of the dojo wall sometimes. Yeah. Now, you've mentioned energy quite a few times, and obviously that's something that threads through the martial arts, but not everyone is conscious of it or articulates it. Does that play a role in your training and what you teach? Oh, definitely. Um, you know, uh, the, the second uh, uh, kanji of Aikido is ki, which is internal energy. And, um, you know, it's nothing magical or mystical. Uh, it's, it's, you know, it can be kind of like a bio uh, energy, a bioelectricity. Um, and they've actually, you know, proven this with uh, devices that you're able to, to measure you know, this, this energy that's in all of us. Um, and so, yeah, that, that internal energy, that cultivation is part of Aikido. It's, it's a, it's, you know, it's a foundational concept, but it's something that takes years and years to cultivate. Um, you know, I've heard a lot of people talk about it, but, uh, not a ton of people have, have dedicated a lot of their training to it. Um, and you know, it's a shame because there are people out there that, take it to, to places that it's kind of ridiculous. And, you know, people, uh, I don't know if you've seen, but I'm sure many of the, my, the, the listeners uh, have seen, there's a YouTube video of a guy who like waves his hand and the guys go flying, you know, that's kind of ridiculous. Um, uh, you know, it's, you're not like Superman, but it is something that can support your overall wellness. It can definitely improve your power of, of your technique, whether it be a strike or a throw, uh, as well as, uh, your mental state. So I think that there's a lot to key training that maybe is lost to some of, you know, the Westerners that practice. Um, it's a very Eastern philosophy and, and, uh, tool that's incorporated into, into training. So, but I think, I think if you look at some, a lot of the masters of old, you know, um, that that were really truly masters. Uh, all of them knew about about key cultivation. You know, because as you get older, your muscles atrophy, um, and so you need to use something else to support it. So uh, key is something that you know that uh, can be cultivated to help support your body and and your mind when as you get older. Hmm. That's a great point. And of course, yeah, there certainly are people that take it to a place that I think most of us would be quite skeptical. There are a couple names that I won't 
mention, you're welcome to, um, that, you know, some, some well-known martial artists that at least over the last few years have been on the bad end of some ridicule for some of the things that they've put out publicly with, with video and with teachings that, um, unfortunately it, it, the rest of the world seems to doubt everything around energy when this is the, what they're seeing. Mm -hmm. Of course, when, when you see nonsense, you know, then, you know, you get that kind of response. A, A lot of times though, the people that really know things, they don't publicize it. They just kind of keep it to themselves because of the, you know, the nonsense that, that people are putting out that claim to know things, but don't really know what they're doing. Um, so, you know, so yeah, it, it's kind of, uh, something that's personal, I think, and, and something that, uh, you know, it should be taken seriously when, you know, if you can find a qualified instructor that actually knows what they're doing. I completely agree. So let's step into a parallel universe for a minute and not one where, you know, energy balls allow us to throw people across the room without touch, but a little bit more realistic one. Sure. But one where you never started martial arts. Okay. What do you think your life would look like, you know, if everything else had stayed the same except you never started training? Well, I mean, that would be a sad life for me, I'll tell you that. Uh, I, I think that uh, the martial arts has been such an influence for me. You know, it's hard for me to say. Um, but I, I think that I probably would have gone down the road of uh, of being an acupuncturist if that's uh, if I, if martial arts were out of the picture totally. Um, I uh, I'm actually a licensed massage therapist and I, I specialize in something called craniosacral therapy. So I enjoy the the healing aspect of things as much you know as as the uh, combat aspect of things. I think they're different sides of the same coin and it's just understanding the human condition. Um, and so, um, understanding acupuncture, uh, you know, uh, is fascinating to me. Um, and, uh, so I, I think maybe that would have been the route that I would have taken if, uh, if I didn't go with martial arts. Interesting. There are a, there's there's a contingent within the firearms defense world that feels that everyone that carries a firearm should be uh, instructed and proficient in assisting someone that's received a gunshot wound. Sort of that you know if you have the ability to to harm but also have the ability to help, uh, and you seem to have that same dichotomy there. The you know the martial background but also you know the healing through massage therapy and and such. Um, is that something that it, you do consciously? Um, yeah, I, I, you know, I, uh, I really thought about, you know, what I wanted to do. And, and so I, I believe that, uh, you know, it's important to understand, you know, uh, about, about helping injury. And, and if you can hurt someone, you should know how to help them. Um, you know, it, it's, it's about being balanced, I think. Um, if all your focus on is hurting and, and injuring or, you know, uh, then I think it's, it's limiting, you know, and, and I'll tell you this, that through my massage therapy education, I've understood, you know, I've had uh, anatomy and physiology training. Um, and so I actually understand my martial arts better through my massage therapy training. Um, I understand how joint manipulation works, how musculature works. And so, you know, it, it just makes my techniques that much more effective because I can apply that knowledge. But vice versa, you know, um, I've had students that, you know, that have uh, ha- got injury during training and I've been able to help them on the spot because as a teacher, you know, you want to make sure that your students have longevity and, and are feeling good uh, so that they can continue training and they're not uh, incapacitated, you know, long term and you know, taken out of the dojo. So, you know, when I, when I see, you know, one of my students that are are injured, you know, I try and help them when I can, uh, you know, and I'm not a physician, so, you know, my scope is limited in that respect, but, um, you know, but within the confines of massage therapy, I can definitely help them and I have helped them. 
So I think that it's important to understand both sides of the coin. Absolutely. And I think that if there were more massage therapists practicing near and, and even in dojos, I think they might do very well. Uh, I don't know about you or and listeners, I don't know about you personally, but I know I like getting massage after a particularly hard workout. And what, what better place to have it than at the training school? So. Oh, definitely. And, you know, I, I think that the more uh, your body is in uh, good physical condition, the, the better it's going to be able to perform on the mat. And so I think that actually getting massages should be something that all martial artists should do at some point. You know, I think on, on a on a regular basis, maybe once once a month, twice a month, if not more, uh, depending on your your physical condition. But you know, if your if your muscles are pliable, you're going to get less injury. So it makes total sense to to have that as part of your training regimen. Plus, it feels great. It does feel great, and it's certainly something that's part of my recovery process. I get massage a few times a month. But one of the things that uh, might be worth sharing if there are people out there that don't receive massage, I don't have the same anatomy and physiology experience that you do. I'm certainly not a licensed massage therapist, but I've learned a lot about my body just by having massage done, by having a skilled therapist digging into, you know, something that hurts and trying to figure out, okay, why does that hurt? What caused it? I mean, sometimes you know, but sometimes you don't. Sure. Sure. Uh, you know, I think, I think, uh, you know, uh, it just, it gets you more in tune with your body. Like you had said, um, you, you learn to feel, wow, you know, I didn't know I, I was feeling that way or, you know, I didn't know I had that pain until she started digging, you know, or he started digging. Um, and, uh, so yeah, I, I agree with you. I think that it teaches you more about your body. It teaches you how to be more in tune. Uh, so, so I, I think that it's, it's therapeutic. Definitely. Totally. So now that we get to step back into the real world, the one where you have trained, okay. and, you know, we, do, we don't have to forget any of your, your experience. Let's kind of go to the, the other end of the spectrum. We've talked about a lot of positives. I'd like you to think about a low point, something challenging or, or difficult in your life. And how, tell us about that and how your martial arts training or your experience allowed you to move past it. Well, uh, one, one event that, that sticks out in my mind is uh, I actually tore ligaments off my bone in my wrist. Uh, and uh, I mean, it, it actually completely detached. And so I needed uh, wrist reconstruction surgery. And, um, you know, so that was for me devastating because my livelihood is my hands, you know, my livelihood is my hands uh, with what I do, you know, um, as a martial artist, uh, the full time martial artist, uh, you know, your hands are, are so important. So, you know, when, when I went to the surgeon, they told, she told me, she said, you know, you need to find a new career. She told me flat out, she said, you need to find something else to do because you're not going to do martial arts again like this. Um, and uh, so that was, that was uh, difficult to hear. However, though, um, I, I strongly believe that when there's a will, there's a way. You know, I, I, I've seen people in wheelchairs do martial arts. I've seen uh, people with extremities missing do martial arts. And so, you know, if it wasn't for uh, the perseverance that martial arts teaches you, I may have given up and just been like, well, the doctor says I shouldn't do it. So I'm not doing, it, I'm giving up. But, um, one thing that I've always learned is that you don't give up. And, you know, if you give up in a fight, then you're done. And so this is no different. Um, so I, I, uh, did a lot of therapy. You know, I had the, the ligaments reattached. They had a cadaver, ligament put in and they, they attached it. And, um, I actually had metal spikes going through my wrist at one point to attach it. And so what I did during that time is I just did training with one hand and, and my feet, uh, and, and I just honed those skills until my wrist was functional. Um, and, uh, you know, with my understanding of, of essential oils and homeopathics and things like that, I was able to get to a place where now I'm 
I have full use of my my wrist. Um, so so, you know, I, I'm I'm back training, and, and you know, this surgery happened years ago. But um, if it wasn't for the martial arts and and teaching me about the commitment and perseverance uh, of sticking with something even when things aren't easy, uh, you know, I, I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today. So uh, so that's that's how. Uh, martial arts helped me get out of a low point. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's pretty heavy stuff there. Now, I just want to go back to kind of a specific and certainly not the highlight of the story, but you said that you have ligaments from a cadaver. Yeah. What that's that's pretty cool. I mean, I, I've never I've never heard of it. That's that's fascinating. What's that like having I mean really a piece from somebody else inside your body? I'll tell you, I mean, honestly, I, I uh, you know, I, I haven't thought much about it. I mean, it, it's such a small piece, honestly. I mean, it's kind of cool, I guess, but uh, I, I really haven't, like, uh, thought much about it because I, I don't want to dwell on the surgery. I don't want to dwell on the negative. I want to, you know, move forward, and so I just kind of try and put it in the past as, as best I can. And, you know, I acknowledge it. I respect it. Um, but, um, yeah, I, I mean the body's an amazing thing. And, uh, you know, you know, the the fact that it can heal like that is is just phenomenal. And, and, you know, what medical science can do to help you heal now is, is, uh, pretty amazing. Yeah. Without a doubt. And the other thing that kind of strikes me about the way you told that story is the, the fusion of Eastern and Western approaches. I mean, the, the surgery to repair, but then also the assistance that you did that, you know, I, I don't know what, or is that wrist a hundred percent usable now? I would say probably about 90, 95%. Yeah. 90, okay. 95%. Um, I mean, I have full use of it, but you know, there's a little bit of, uh, of sensitivity and restriction to it, but you know, I, I just suck it up, you know, uh, <laughs> <laughs> You know, what do you, you know, I, I don't want to cry over it and I just do what I can do and I respect my body and, uh, you know, but it doesn't stop me, uh, you know, so, so, uh, you know, so it's functioning enough for me to do what I love. And, uh, so I'm thankful. That's great. And then, you know, the, the piece I was kind of honing in on was the fact that they told you, you know, that you wouldn't be able to do martial arts again. And I'm assuming that what they meant was that wrist would never be strong enough and durable enough. Well, they to told do me martial arts. They, no, they told me to find another career. They said, they said, stop doing martial arts. You're, you're getting older and, uh, you know, you're gonna, you're, you're not going to be able to do it. You know, uh, you're going to, you're going to hurt yourself is what they told me. They said, so give up. Uh, mm. so I guess I'm not a good patient because I, I didn't listen. <laughs> <laughs> The the statistics, I mean, we'll go a little bit off topic for a second, but all the statistics, and I might have said this on the show before, of cancer survivors is that Mm -hmm. those that survive an ordeal like that are the worst patients. They don't accept everything that the doctors say. They do their own research. They do their own treatments, you know, like Mm -hmm. you did, and they're the ones that make it through, and it's it's a mindset. Uh, Actually, to touch on that point, it's interesting that you brought that up. Um, I actually, uh, work with a nonprofit organization that deals with cancer survivors and I teach them, uh, Qigong, which are Chinese energy methods. And I have one student in particular who has been with me for a couple of years and they told him when he started with me that he would have, uh, like, uh, a year to live it is like a year to live six months to a year. This was six years ago. Um, And the only thing that he did differently, which he attributes to his survival is the practice of energy cultivation of of Qigong and moving meditation. Um, And he'll tell you straight out that this is the only thing that I did differently than, you know, and it made a profound impact on him. And I see with other uh, cancer survivors that, that work with me, you know, and I'm not saying that I'm a, a cure for cancer. I'm not saying that by any means. Um, but there is definitely an improvement in in their overall quality of life with with uh, many of these students that practice it consistently and regularly. Um, 
you know, so, uh, you know, I, I think, you know, the many aspects of the martial arts can, can have profound impact on all aspects of life, not just in the dojo and not just for a self-defense situation. Absolutely. And longtime listeners will remember that we interviewed Rabbi G, the founder of the Kids Kicking Cancer Organization. I'm not sure if you're familiar with that. Uh, they're based out of the Detroit area. And it's the same thing that you're talking about, but their focus is children with chronic illness. Well, I do that too. And Actually, I, I have something. Uh, I have the Kids Karate Project which is oh, cool. uh, kids with uh, special needs. Um, and I'm, I actually developed a program which combines uh, Kempo and, um, and uh, meditation and Qigong to, to help increase their overall energy levels um, for, for uh, kids afflicted with, uh, with cancer. Uh, and also uh, kids who have family members who are afflicted with cancer and other special needs. Um, and so... Uh, the cancer support community and uh, Camelot for Children, uh, who are two nonprofit organizations, have been implementing my program, and they really have seen you know great results, and, they, and the kids really love it, and you know they they, they have more energy, and um, they're learning focus, and and a way to empower these kids is, is always a benefit. Yeah, yeah, and uh, hopefully once we finish up, you can get me some information on those groups so we can make sure we post it in your show notes because I bet the listeners would be interested in, in uh, finding out more because it's, it's such a powerful subject and something, you know, I, I don't think there can be too many groups working with martial arts. First off, I mean, listeners know my, my goal is that everyone in the world does martial arts, at least for a little while. And there certainly isn't a more deserving group of this education than a group such as someone suffering from illness to help mitigate their pain or to give them some focus and some uh, a sense of power in their lives again. So, definitely, yeah, definitely. We'll, we'll get that stuff posted over on the website. Uh, potential new listeners, that's whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Now, I've got your bio here. I mean, there's some some good stuff going on in there, some big names. You and I talked a little bit. You've had the opportunity to train with some some pretty, some pretty prominent people, a little bit of alliteration there. But if you had to think about the person who is most influential, and let's, let's take out your immediate instructors. I'll make you work a little bit for this question. <laughs> who would you say the most important person in your martial arts career has been? That's so hard. Uh, I, you know, I, I, I'll tell you that I'm very thankful for the teachers that I have. I'm, I'm so thankful for them. I, I mean, I couldn't be where I am without them. Um, however, if, if I had to exclude them, um, I, I would say that um, first and foremost, my parents for allowing me and supporting me during my training as a child. I mean, because if it wasn't for them taking me every week to, to the dojo, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't have... Uh, learned what I learned. Um, so definitely my parents are, are, you know, play a big role and I thank them for, you know, for supporting me enough to, to pay for his classes for all these years. Um, and then I would also say the, the, my martial arts, uh, brothers and sisters who trained with me over the years and, you know, let me throw them and strike them and, and do, uh, all the fun techniques that I, I've learned. You know, uh, without without the, my classmates, um, I would just be by myself. So, you know, they they help me be better. So I thank all of them as well. Great answer, and certainly parents, I think, is the most popular answer to that question, because most of us started when you were we were young. Yeah. So we needed that that support from our parents. I can, you know, I, my my mom was right there for me. Absolutely. So let's talk about competition a little bit. You gotten involved in the competitive side of martial arts? I actually, I haven't. And um, I, that just never interested me. Um, I, and I, I don't belittle anyone who wants to do competition. If that's, if that's your uh, desire, then I think that there are things that you can definitely learn from it. However, though, um, I, I, the, the idea of trophies and medals don't uh don't interest me you know i do this 
uh, for intrinsic reasons. You know, I want to make myself better. I, and, and I don't need to, I don't feel, uh, prove myself to anybody. I'm satisfied with, um, with my training and, and what the martial arts has done for me. And, um, so, you know, going to a competition doesn't have that appeal. Um, also there's always someone better than you. Um, and so, you know, if you go and, and, and you win great, but there could be someone, you know, around the corner that that's better than you. So, you know, don't get a big ego. Um, you know, I mean, it, you see it all the time. If you look at the UFC, how often do champions change? I mean, uh, they're always changing, right? And people who were on top suddenly get beat, you know, and then, then they're old news. So if the only thing that you're training for is a trophy, what happens when there's no more trophies? Then you, you've lost something. You know, when you train to become better and, and perfect your knowledge, then I think you have longevity. And I, I think you you constantly strive to be better in that way. Uh, you know, so for me, uh, competition was never an interest, uh, you know, so. Yeah, and I agree with absolutely everything you said. Of course, listeners know. I'm a strong believer in competition for the people that it's right for. And, and but if it's a, and it's a sport, it's okay, you know. And yes. So so again, if 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 people want to do it, there are things that you can benefit from by by learning, you know, by by participating. I just for me, I I don't, uh, you know, it doesn't interest me personally. Sure. And one of the beauties about the martial arts is that there are so many different aspects to it, so many different ways that you can find your niche, the thing that works for you, that motivates you, that that's okay. Mm -hmm. This isn't basketball. You know, if, if basketball is your life, you're, you kind of need to play basketball. You need to play games against others. Mm -hmm. There aren't too many people that just live in their driveway shooting free throws. Mm -hmm. Well, but I, I mean, I work with others. I have people attacking me every day. You know, um, and that's how I hone my skills is by people really trying to hit me and, uh, you know, with no pads on and, and, uh, and if I get hit and if I get taken down, well, then I have something to work on and that's the motivator. You know, um, it's not that the skills of, of the people doing the tournaments are any better or worse per se. Um, it's just the, you know, it's just that, you know, what, what is the end purpose of, of doing what you're doing? You know. Yeah. No, I'm I'm right there with you. I agree. So I'd like you to think about the people that you haven't had the opportunity to train with. People that are alive or even people that are dead. And if you could pick out one of those people to train with, who would that be and why? Well, I mean that's uh that's interesting. I I mean I think I think Maybe Sukaka Takeda would be a person that uh, would be fascinating for me. And he's the per person, for your listeners that don't know, that taught Morihei Ueshiba, the founder of Aikido. Um, and he was uh, kind of a ruthless combat person, um, uh, you know, uh, head of Daitoryu Aikido Jiu Jitsu. Uh, you know, but he was well known for his combat prowess and, and you know, just his overall technique. And so, that that would be really interesting to me, um, definitely to to go back in time and train with him. Uh, you know, if he could make a student like Mori Ueshiba, I mean, he's got to know something. Uh, so you know, I think that he would definitely be someone. Maybe even uh, Minamoto Musashi, uh, the famous samurai, mm -hmm. or or Mori Ueshiba. Even I mean, as an Aikido person, you know, uh, I would have loved to train with him as well. There, there's I mean, there's so many great masters over the, the centuries that, you know, you could learn from all of them. Uh, so, uh, you know, it's hard to pick just one. But, uh, you know, if I had to, you know, probably Sakako Takeda would be one of the people. That's okay. This isn't a test. There are no right answers. You, you, could, <laughs> you could pick a couple. We'll, we'll let you get away with it. That's fine. Uh, thank no, you. And those are... <laughs> <laughs> no okay. worries. And, of course, those are those are great answers. and. Um, I, I know a little bit about Takeda, so um, yeah. And anybody, as you said, anybody who had the opportunity to teach 
Oh, Sensei, right? That's the yeah. Oh, Sensei. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Anybody had the the ability had an influence on the man that pioneered Aikido. I mean, certainly must have been doing something amazing. So to train with him would be incredible. Yeah. Now, how about movies? Are are you at all a movie guy? Um, sure, I like movies definitely. Okay. Do you have a favorite martial arts movie, or or you know, we won't even be that restrictive. Maybe a couple of them. <laughs> I will, I'll tell you, I'll tell you this, you know, um, growing up, you know, in the, uh, seventies and eighties, uh, you know, the original karate kid was one that, you know, I guess sticks out in my mind, you know, and, uh, maybe I'm dating myself a little bit, but, uh, yeah, I mean, there was something about that movie at the time that was, uh, I don't know. It just seemed better than in the typical action movie. So I would say that that movie, uh, was probably one of my favorite martial art movies, uh, you know, throughout my martial arts career. And actually, um, I had the opportunity to meet with uh, Martin Cove, you know, who is the Cobra Kai instructor. Yeah. And he's actually such a nice down to earth guy. I mean, he was he was so friendly and, and um, humble, you know, which was really nice to see. Um, so, yeah, I would I would say the original Karate Kid movie. It's a fantastic movie. And uh, it was within the last month. It happened to be on TV and I was flipping through and it was right near the beginning. So I stopped and watched it. It had been a couple of years and Mm -hmm. it really holds up. I mean, the acting was never the reason any of us loved that movie. It was the the authenticity of it. I mean, just that kind of relationship. I think any of us that train have always wanted, some of us have been lucky enough to have a relationship with a martial arts instructor like Daniel and Mr. Miyagi. Mm-hmm, definitely. So, uh, did uh, Martin Cove didn't didn't sweep your leg or, or he didn't sweep my leg? No. Do anything else? <laughs> <laughs> no, he's just a very nice guy. So, uh, so yeah. I've heard that from a number of other people. Maybe we can get him on the show sometime. He's certainly someone I would like to talk to. How about yeah. actors? You have any favorite martial arts actors? Not particularly. Uh, you know, I, I have to say I liked. Um, Donnie Yen, who who played Ip Man in, in that 2008 film, uh, you know, so I, I kind of liked the way that he portrayed the character, and I, I liked you know his focus, and so that was a, that was a, a fun movie for me. Um, but but overall, you know, I don't have any favorite actors. You know, um, there are actors that make good films, and the same actors can make bad films, and so you know, from film to film, uh, you know, they vary, I guess. They do. They certainly do. Uh, we do a, a Thursday episode, which tends to be a little bit shorter, and I'm finishing up our episode on Jackie Chan. Mm-hmm. And just as I'm learning more about Jackie Chan, the numbers of terrible films he put out that <laughs> none of us even know about. It's mind-boggling. Something like 150 films he's got to his wow. credit. Most of us know about a dozen of them. So uh, Donnie Yen, I mean, he's kind of the, the martial arts actor of the moment, isn't he? I mean, it's going to be in the next Star Wars movie and the Ip Man movies and just keeps turning out some great stuff. Yeah, yeah, I like I like some of the films that he's done. Yeah. So let's talk about books. Okay. Now we're going to talk about your books in a second. But before we go there, do you have a favorite book that you didn't write? I would have to say Aikido in a Dynamic Sphere, but, and I think it's by Westbrook and Ratty. Off the top of my head, I think that's those are the authors. Um, but I, there's just something about that book and the, the philosophy behind it that I really enjoy. Um, the techniques at the end of the book, uh, I actually, you know, uh, not that they're, they're good techniques and everything. I just I don't even like really look at the technique part, but the the philosophy and the the uh, the writing about Aikido in that book. I think it is a great book. And that, that book has been around for a very long time and um, I recommend it to all my students. So I, I would say that uh, that book is probably on the top of my list. Sounds like a good book. And of course, I'll dig up the link to that, find the authors and everything and link that f- for everyone over at the show notes. But let's talk about your books now. I mean, the, right. the context in which we met was, you know, I, I, we were both in Atlantic City and, and I had a gentleman pull me aside and said, you need to meet this guy. And so I got dragged into a room. You were shooting some promotional videos, if I remember correctly, right? Uh, for photography, photo shoot? Yeah, yeah okay. the photo shoot, yeah. yeah. 
uh, a photo not, shoot to promote this book that you've just released? Well, well, well to be well, it's not released yet. I'm actually it's in okay. production now. Um, so basically, this book is called Modern Masters of the Martial Arts, and what it is, it's a, a photographic encyclopedia of different styles. Um, and uh, we have uh, one master featured from, you know, from several different styles uh, that will that will uh, explain about their art. Um, give a little insight and also, you know, demonstrate a technique in the book, you know, and it's going to be a hardcover, you know, uh, full color, really nice book. Um, and so we, we're, you know, we want to have about uh, 55 or more instructors and in, featured in this book. And so what we were doing was we were taking uh, uh, photos for the book, um, you know, so that they could be included and, uh, we're lucky enough to have, you know, such masters as Stephen Hayes, the famous ninjutsu person, uh, Michael De Pasquale Jr. Uh, you know, uh, we have a famous uh, world champion sumo wrestler. So we have a, you know, we have a, a good group of people. Um, and actually, I, I, you know, there are one or two spots available that we're looking to fill still. And once we fill them, then uh, what we'll do is we'll we'll continue with production. You know, the the publisher will will continue and and then it should be out, uh, you know, soon after that. So, uh, yeah, so that's what we were doing. We were we were working on this book and taking photos and we, we hired a great photographer. His name is John Bells, who uh, he does uh, photos for the event as well. But um, some of the photos that he took were just super. So uh, thanks, John, if you're listening. And uh, and uh, but yeah, so that's what we were doing at the time. Oh, great. Now, you mentioned there were a couple slots still after those particular styles that you're looking for a high-level master well, to fill? Well, we're we're open to considering any style. As long as we don't have the style already included in the book, um, then, you know, we we accept uh, applications to, to be included. Um, so, so uh, you know, we, we have a good majority of, of styles already, but, you know, people can contact me and, you know, and... Uh, and fill out an application if they're interested, and then we'll we'll look at it. And if we don't have that style, and if their lineage and training is is authentic, then uh, you know we'll we'll be happy to include them. Oh, great! And where can people go? Maybe there's a list of styles that you've already locked in that they could look at, or you know, how would they get more information? Sure, they can go to the uh, book website, which is mastersofthemartialarts.com. And on that page, there's an, a button they can click to fill out the SERP, the application um, <clears throat> to to apply. And uh, so they just do that, and then I'll get back to them uh, shortly, and then in, in, in within a few days to uh, to let them know if, uh, if we have that art already, and or or if uh, we'd like to include them. Great. And of course, once that book is released, I'll, I'll ask you. Let me know so we can update the show notes. So if people are listening to this in the future, you know, right now it's February 10th and that book hasn't, of 2016, that book hasn't come out yet. But, you know, in the near future, it sounds like it's going to be out and available. So uh, we'll make sure we update the show notes to get people to all the different ways that they could order that book, take a look at it. Appreciate it. Whatever the different methods are. Yeah, sure. So. Tell us a little bit about what's keeping you motivated. What, what gets you to get up every day and train and work on books and go to seminars and go to Japan and all that. What, why do you keep doing this? It's fun. <laughs> I love it. It's, uh, you know, I, I think it's, uh, given me so much, honestly, uh, you know, and it influenced my life in so many different ways that, uh, I want more. And, uh, you know, I, I, I think, uh, I always try and make myself better. And that's, that's what the, you know, martial arts gives to me. Um, but also I think it's important, um, that I, I share this information with, uh, my students. And I think that's another motivator for me is that, um, you know, I want to be there and, and share what I, uh, what I have and, um, maybe give other people the opportunity to get the benefits that I did, you know, growing up. So, um, that's another big motivator for me. Um, and, but I, I also think that, um, I think giving up is kind of like a failure. I think, so I, I don't want to accept failure. And so I keep going 
And I, I had imagined I'll be doing this until I can't move anymore. Um, so, so yeah, that's what, that's what keeps me going. Um, you know, the, the, the idea of training every day is fun for me. So, yeah, so I, so I, I don't want to stop. I don't allow myself even the consideration of stopping. That's great. Fun. I mean, it's, if it's not fun, then you're probably doing it wrong. Right. <laughs> <laughs> well, you gotta have the, I mean, there are times when, when, you know, you're like, Oh my God, it's, it's grueling and exhausting, but, uh, yeah. Um, it's all how you look at things. There's a, a term in Japanese called Shoshin, which means beginner's mind. And, um, it's basically that, uh, everything you do in life from tying your shoes to a one punch or a kick or whatever it is you're doing, you should do it with a hundred percent of your spirit. Um, because it, it, you know, it may be the last time you're allowed to do it again. So do it, you know, with all of your heart. Um, and so, you know, uh, every time I go in the dojo, I try and have Shoshin. A great approach. Absolutely. So if people want to know more about you, you know, tell us what, what do you have going on right now? We talked about the book. Um, you know, if people are in your vicinity and want to come train or if this weekend warrior sure. well, I, camp I, is open. I mean, t- tell us, tell us about you and, and sell yourself here. This is your commercial time. Okay. Uh, well, so I guess, uh, you know, firstly, there's the retreat, which is in July, uh, 15th to the 17th. And people can check out uh, more information, um, on, on the website, which is karate training camp.com. Um, and that has a video of, of last year's event and some testimonials and uh, some pricing and things like that. So if people are interested in, in coming and training, we'd love to have you. And, you know, there's no ego. Uh, we don't care what style or experience you, you have. You know, everyone's in the martial arts community. And so, you know, everyone's welcome. Um, but if you have a good attitude, then, then you should be there. Uh, so that's one thing I'm working on. Uh, also. Um, myself and, uh, my, uh, teacher Andrade Sheehan, um, we have, um, an instructor, uh, certification curriculum, uh, and, um, where if you're a black belt, you can study these courses and we teach you different curricula, which then you can implement at your own dojo and, um, offer something new to your students, which is always great for retention and, and motivation. Um, so we have a weapons curricula, we have a ground fighting curricula, we have a weapon disarming curricula, and also, um, you know, like a, a, a taijutsu, a, a, you know, a combat uh, hand-to-hand uh, curricula. So you can get, you know, certified in any one of these things. And uh, people can find out more about that at uh, combatcourses.com. Uh, so we're, we're, you know, so that's another thing that I've been working on and we go around the country and we give seminars at different people's schools. Um, you know, so if people are interested in seminars, they can contact me uh, directly, uh, you know, um, and, uh, you know, we'd be happy to, to, to come out to you and, and do something for you. Um, other projects that I'm working on, uh, I'm actually co-authoring uh, uh, another book besides this uh, Masters of the Martial Arts book. Uh, we, I've co-authored a book with um, Andrade Sheehan uh, on Aikido Neiwaza, which is the Aikido ground fighting. Um, and this is uh, going to be published, we're hoping, uh, by the end of May. Uh, and, and it's going to have its, uh, you know, uh, Aikido ground fighting techniques. And, and the name of the book is uh, Aikido's Hidden Ground Fighting. And uh, there'll be a companion uh, DVD that people can purchase as well. Uh, and that's through uh, Chambuli Media. You know, people can, can order the book through them and it'll, it'll eventually be on Amazon and Barnes and & Noble and that kind of thing. So I have a lot on my plate. And, you know, besides teaching my yeah. regular classes every, every day. <laughs> you are a busy man, but it sounds like you're doing a lot to give back and to share your knowledge. And I applaud that. I think that's wonderful. I wish all martial artists of of experience were working as hard as you to give back and to share their knowledge. Oh, I appreciate so, it. Thank you. thank you. And just before we wrap up, any parting words of wisdom for everyone listening? 
Well, I guess, you know, always train hard, you know, don't make excuses. Um, and you know, when you train, you know, uh, you know, you know, give it everything you have on that day. Uh, also, if you're looking for an instructor, if you're new to the martial arts, find someone who has legitimate credentials. Cause there's a lot of people that, um, make up their own techniques and make up their own systems. And, you know, you want, you want someone who has real lineage. Uh, you know, I think that's important. You know, you wouldn't go to a university that wasn't accredited. So why leave something like your martial arts education to, to just anybody, you know, but, um, but, you know, do it, do it and work hard and, and you'll succeed. Uh, it's, you know, never give up. Thank you for listening to episode 60 of Whistlekick Martial Arts Radio, and thank you to Sokodai Nemiroff for your time and your stories. Head on over to whistlekickmartialartsradio.com for the show notes with links to the things we talked about today, including Sokodai's book, his school, his instructor certification classes, and a lot more. If you like the show, please subscribe or download one of the apps so you never miss out on a new episode. And if we could trouble you to leave us a review wherever you download your podcasts, we'd really appreciate that. Remember, if we read your review on the air, just email us and we'll get you a free pack of Whistlekick stuff. If you want to be a guest on the show or you know someone that would be a great interview, please fill out the guest form over at whistlekickmartialartsradio.com. Or if you just want to shoot us a message with a suggestion for a Thursday show topic or some other feedback, there's a place to do that on the website too. You can follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram, all with the username Whistlekick. And remember the products we make here at Whistlekick, like our sparring boots and a whole lot more, and those are at whistlekick.com. So, until next time, train hard, smile, and have a great day.